Good year with TSBVI. Well, welcome yeah. everyone to the Virtual Excel Academy. We're glad to see you here. Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you are here to join us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. We're here with you and we're so excited to have you with us on this Monday, Monday morning, mon Monday afternoon, Monday evening. We have today a very special guest. Cindy Bockover is joining us from Texas School for the Blind and she is here to talk about optical devices. Her title of her session is called I Can See More with My Optical Devices. So if you have any magnifiers, telescopes that you have, please go and gather them. And also a few other things you might wanna pull up are some magazines. If you have any magazines, I have my Koala Rescue National Kids Geographic. And I also have a little art project that I've been working on with Amaya. And so if you can see here, these are a mix of all of her pictures of her cats. And this is perfect for a magnifier because you have to get in very close to see the pictures of the kittens on it. And there's a lot of detail on something like this. So if you have any photographs or magazines, a cereal box would work. Uh, let me think of some other things. Maybe Cindy might give us some hints, but I'll, We'll introduce our hosts as you're gathering our stuff together. Charlotte Cushman from Perkins and Texas Schools for the Blind. She's our PAS to Literacy Manager. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We also have Leanne Grillet, the Director of National Outreach Services from American Printing House for the Blind. Welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here today. And we have Amaya, who is a special guest who shows up every once in a while. And I'm Cheryl Kamehanan, professor from California State University, Los Angeles. We're so glad you're here to join us. Cindy, tell us all about these low vision devices. Okay. I am so glad uh, you're in the lesson today. And I am the low vision consultant at the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And I have low vision myself. I was born with ROP. Um, but I did not start using devices until my 30s. Um, I didn't have a TV, I didn't have access to them. And because of my eye condition, I could bring things up close and see them. But in my mid 30s, I moved to Nashville and started working for a university program that provided optical devices for students and they would do a low vision exam for these students and so by being able to see one of those low vision specialists I finally got telescopes and magnifiers that just changed my world. Um, I am a person who loves art museums and sometimes art museums are hard to get to so when I had my first telescope I remember thinking what do I want to go see and I went since I didn't have an art museum very close I decided I'm going to go to my church and I'm gonna sit in the pews and I'm gonna look at the statues and the paintings on the walls and the stained glass windows. And I can still feel the, wow, that's what is in that painting or that's how those two pieces of glass came together. It was such an aha moment for me that I have just been thrilled that I could then let in my career be able to focus on optical devices. So that's a little bit about my background. And I want to find out, next slide, um, if we can find out in the chat, who are you? How many students are on today? How many parents or how many VI professionals? And that will kind of help me get an idea of how I wanna shape my comments. Cause I'm mostly gonna be talking to the students but there'll be some comments for the adults too. Welcome Lisa from Hawaii, a TVI, Jill, a TVI, Jennifer, a TVI, Skya, a TVI, um, a student. We have Merrick from, um, and we have another TVI, Becky, Kristen is a TVI, Andrew is an instructor, Sarah is a TVI, Susan's a TVI, Marianne is a professional, another TVI, Natalie is a preschool TVI. Kian is a college student. Welcome, Kian. Uh, let's see, a, couple, a lot of TVIs. Jessica is a student. Denise is a parent and a, 
uh, meet an EI vision specialist. I Rana saw Sanaya and Ryan as students. Amanda is a parent. Okay. An intervener, Lisa. So how about my second question, I want to direct to the students. Are you, you've never used a device, this is really new to you, but you are interested? Or have you used just a little bit? Or are you a more experienced user? Like you've been able to use your tools for more than a year. Kian is asking, what sort of device? And specific today, we're specifically going to talk about not the electronic ones, the ones that are handheld, and it's just a lens, or with a magnifier, it might have batteries. So a handheld magnifier, and I could show, let's see, on the next, um, I could show mine if we want to switch the screen or in another minute, in another slide, uh, there'll be device, examples of devices. Basically. Okay. We're getting some responses here, Cindy. Um, so I know Corey, that's not actually your name. I think it's Kia, the, the daughter of Corey. Anyway, um, Corey has some devices and was born with ROP. Um, another person, it's new to them in kindergarten, starting to use more and more. Uh, Ryan has been using his tools for four years now. Aisha is a secondary student transitioning to college. And Aisha, let us know about if you use optical devices, please. Liam is more experienced, but with older devices, not experienced with newer devices. Um, Jessica says, I had a telescope monocular. I like to pretend I was a pirate. I could see the board better. Um, Julie says, somewhat familiar with devices, but using electronic devices more and more, so rusty with the others. Keen doesn't use any magnifiers, doesn't have sight. Well, we're glad you're with us anyway, Keen. Uh, let's see. That's it for the students okay. who have responded. We have a few people who are, uh, have their hands raised, and maybe we can call on them just to share what they would like to say also. Okay. So, Stephen, it looks Steven. like... And you can press your space bar, Stephen, to, to talk. Okay, he might not have the right software system. If uh, Jorge. Jorge, thank you. Jorge, try pressing and holding the space bar down. Okay, sometimes uh, if you are using just the web system and not true Zoom, that can happen. Uriah? Well. Hi, Uriah. Um, so I use handheld magnifiers that I've been using since third, third grade and I'm visually impaired myself. I was born blind and yeah. Okay, thanks, Uriah. And just a few more quick things that have come in the chat box. Uh, Parker's great with Apple devices. Uh, Mara is an experienced device user and has been for the last seven years. Uh, Mackenzie is a high school student interested in devices. And Aisha has experience with devices and uses Braille as well. Okay. And I think that demonstrates really that there's a wide range of us in the lesson today. Um, in age, in level of vision that you have. So my goal today is kind of some general pointers, some general principles on devices. Um, and two things that it's really cool to see the more stuff, to be able to read the signs, to be able to look more closely at jewelry, to watch people dancing across the street. And it's all about getting yourself to practice more. So on the slide, it's, it says vision tools of today. And on the left is um, from Star Trek, 
but an example of what we're seeing more and more of, like uh, Google Glasses or eSight, and those are definitely a developing tool. We're not going to talk about that today. And then on the right is an example of a smartphone, which when I talk with either students or adults who have low vision and ask, you know, what's your, the tool you use the most, almost always I hear, it's my smartphone. And I, um, I recognize that it is a good tool, but it is not a tool that was built to help you see things. And that's why I like using optical devices. I know in the classrooms especially, we have so much high tech now um, that helps see the board or you're holding an iPad where you can zoom and enlarge the print. Those are rechargeable tools that we're using a lot more in the classroom today. And I've always told my students, I agree, looking at algebra on the board or reading my science book, that is not the most interesting. I want to see the cool stuff around me at home or downtown or when I'm walking on the trail. And that's why I keep my devices with me. So um, the next slide is going to show some of the tools that I'm, or this is, uh, again, uh, there's on the right, these are, I think of as starter tools. There's the dome that it looks kind of like a glass paperweight and it has to sit flat on the page. So that's a good starter tool. And then there's a really short telescope on the right that is a low powered one. And it's easier to start out with lower powered. So these are examples that may be starter tools, but we're gonna move to the more kind of the next step of tools. So you'll see on this that there's magnifiers on the left, there's one that has a rectangle lens that the whole goal is to get as much in the lens as I can. And then the one below that is one that I have all around my house. I always have in my bag because I take it to the grocery store and I can read price tags or I can read menus if I'm at the restaurant. On the right, we have on the top is an example of probably the most common type of telescope. It's a tube that has two lenses. And I think it's important to know the words that help you talk about your tool. Like my um, tube telescope has a barrel in the middle and probably has a little bit of rubber around it so it's easier for you to hold on to. And then it's got a squishy end that's called the eye cup and that goes towards your eye. That is the ocular lens, ocular for eye, and the opposite end is the objective. It's closer to the object that you're looking at. So I've got the eye cup, the ocular lens, the barrel, and the objective lens. And one thing I tell students that sometimes it doesn't happen right at the beginning, you can roll that eye cup down. Typically it stands up kind of tall where you can squeeze it, but if you roll it down, you're getting that device even closer to your eye. And that's what we want. If we could, the best thing would be like a contact lens where that lens is right on top of your eye. So you're getting the most field of seeing through that. And I like to call it a scope. Monocular is another word. And if you think of binoculars, all we did with a monocular or a telescope is we're just using one tube. Because for most of us students, us with low vision, one eye is stronger than the other. And then there is an example of a telescope at the bottom of the slide that is, it's not a tube, it's a different focusing system. It's got a little lever. And that's just an example and a reminder that there's all types of devices out there. And that's important to know. So we've got a question coming up on the next slide. Because I want to, at the beginning of this, it was what are devices, why do we use them, and then how do they work? So now we're at the why question. And if you can, if you've used your tools and you can either magnify or scope, why do you want to, uh, what is it that you're seeing? 
Why am I using my device? What am I seeing more? And you could type that in. I'd, I'd be really curious to hear some examples. Kian is asking what's on the slide. And Kian, there is a speech bubble. It's a large speech bubble with the word why. Why use an optical device? And so for those of you at home, if you are able to type in your chat window, please respond. Why use an optical device? And while people are typing, uh, Marianne has her hand raised. So Marianne, do you want to, uh, we can unmute you and you can push your space bar to let us know why you use an optical device. Marianne, you can push your space bar. Not working. Um, we have to access the world around you to read websites, do schoolwork, gather information from my environment, make text bigger, menus on the wall behind the ordering counters, to read street, street signs, to read the fine print on medicine bottles or a TV guide. And that example of um, street signs on your O&M lesson or menus, we hear a lot. Those are good examples. And I am curious on if we can even think of more cool things to look at beyond that, in, in, in addition to that, really. I really like what Jane says. She says, to save my posture. <laughs> Very good comment. And we have a reminder, um, if people could just choose to all panelists and attendees when you write in the chat box, then everybody will be able to read what you write. To oh. read five print is one more. And Skaya says to read faster and easier. That's, that's a great point with the more you practice, the faster you'll get. And it does get easier. It's like dribbling a basketball. Um, I've had to do a lot of practice to get better at that. Um, but you do. And some more responses to be able to tell what's around me, watching sports, reading labels, reading and doing my homework. Uh, what about to see exit signs in a building and to navigate the world much closer? Watching the television. Yeah, and seeing we'll the board. About some of those examples, great. So and I've got on the next slide maybe some examples, and this says skills to access visual info, information, which is being able to see it. On the top, I have an example of a microwave. And if you think of your microwave at home, those buttons have labels. And if I can read those, what's written on those uh, buttons, then I can transfer that, and to the right of that is an example of somebody using a copier then I take my magnifier over to the copier when I'm needing to figure out, you know, am I collating this or do I need, how do I switch to the next screen? So that microwave skill transfers to the work environment. On the bottom of the slide, there's an example of a wrestling match and the uh, person who said to watch sports because we're probably pretty far away from the mat or the court or the field looking at the athlete, if I can find them in my school setting, then I can go on the bottom of the slide on the right, I can watch at an outdoor festival uh, what the, there's a break dancing being shown in that picture. So I can see what others are looking at. So building that skill when you're a student lets you, as you get older, be able to participate in more of the activities. So our next slide 
talks, the bit, most important word here is motivation, being motivated to use. And that means that I'm keeping my tools around me. They're readily available. They're in good shape. I know where they are. Um, and on the slide, it also says there's high expectations. I have high expectations for myself of where I'm using it. There's high interest things that I want to look at. Things that really get me excited to want to see. And then at the beginning, it's high success. So we're looking at things that are maybe bigger or bolder, easier to find. And there's a picture on the screen of two girls at the produce section in a supermarket. And you know, in the supermarket, sometimes overhead is the label that might have the price or what's called the UPC code. It's the, uh, that identifies that particular product. And if I'm shopping and I need to mark my, um, when I bag my lettuce, I need to put the UPC code on it. That, that can be small print. So I keep my telescope with me at the grocery store so that I can look up because sometimes those, how that's marked is above my head. So that's another example of um, how uh, tools can be used. So on the next slide, it's got some blank lines. What do you like to look at? And you might want to um, fill this in more on your own. And, and we'll keep talking through the lesson today about things I want to think about. Huh, I wonder if my magnifier would help me see that. Because we're, it's spring now, um, looking at bugs can be really cool. That's one example of what you can look at with your magnifier. If you get a, like a jar or a clear a plastic container and can get a bug in there and then examine it, you're, you're watching it and seeing how it moves around with your magnifier and then you can let that little critter go, but it can be really cool to examine those um, and that's one way to use your magnifier. For your telescope, um, because it's been beautiful weather here in Texas and getting outside, there are trails that I can be on um, and like finding a bird in a tree, that's hard. That's a good skill because they blend in and they're small, but now because we're not in school, we have more time to try. We have more time to figure out what is it that I want to see. So um, most of us aren't going to a lot of stores, but I can still, um, a good practice would be if you can go with your parent and sit in the parking lot that maybe has a lot of stores and you can take your telescope and see if you can read signs while you're sitting in the car and watching the people who were walking or sitting at an intersection. And you say when the light changes because you're telling your parent that or you're looking for signs along the road. So that's kind of a long explanation for that thinking about what do I want to see? What do I want to look at? And so now we're going to move into the, the real part of this on the next slide. It's Cindy, can we, can we ask a question before we move on? Uh, yes. Jessica, Jessica's got her hand raised. So let's call on Jessica and see what she wants to say. And Jessica, you're going to push your space bar. Hi, my name is Roman. Oh, Roman, sorry. It must be your mom who's Jessica. Yeah. Yes, mom's here. Okay. <laughs> I, was born, I was born with nystagmus, low vision. Yeah. Okay, I know. I yeah, I like using my my monocular to look at mm, mm, cattails and uh, birds. And you mean the the plant cattails, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, I wondered if you had a pet cat. That's a great example because they're really, that's a, 
cool. It feels cool in your hand, but if you can examine that up close and like see the fibers of it, it, it kind of takes on a whole new way of uh, how you think about a cattail. That's a great example, Roman. And a few other people have been writing in the chat some more sciencey things. Uh, somebody likes microbiology and looking at bacteria. And then we have somebody who likes to look at bugs and the ecosystem. Great. And that's it for now. So on this, this slide, it just says how, and it has a uh, washer and a bolt. Um, and this is kind of the nuts and bolts of the how do we get these tools to work? And that the next slide talks about, um, if we think of magnifiers first, on the left, it's the rule, I have written on it, the rule on shape and size. So there's two magnifiers pictured. The one on the left has a bigger round lens, and the one on the right has a small lens. The one on the left might just be two, two and a half inches, and the one on the right is barely an inch. And the, the rule with magnifiers is the bigger the lens, the lower the power. The bigger the lens, the lower the power. So the magnifier on the right that is a smaller size lens, maybe just an inch, that's probably about a 7x or an 8x meaning seven times power or eight times power, which um, we typically don't go above 10 times power on a handheld magnifier. So the one on the left is maybe a 3x and the one on the right is probably a seven or an eight. Now the opposite is true with telescopes. And I'm gonna show a comparison of uh, telescopes here in a minute. The shorter telescopes, are lower in power. It, like uh, one that might just be an inch to an inch and a half, two inches, that's a lower powered one. But if I've got one that's two or three inches tall, that's probably 6x, 8x, and um, we can even go up to 10x in, in telescopes. So shorter in telescope is lower power, taller ones means higher power, and it like 8x, I am eight times closer to the object versus somebody who has a 4x. I am just four times closer. And you'll notice on the objective lens, remember that's the lens that is closer to the object. On a four times scope, that's a little narrower. I've just got a um, 12 millimeter field of view but my 6x has a 16 millimeter field of view. So that's measuring that lens across. And it's just um, helping us know, is it a more powerful scope or not? So on the next slide, it shows some examples. There's a student on the left. He's looking at a can of queso. And you'll see on this how he doesn't have the magnifier flat on the can because that doesn't give it any power and he doesn't have it held up right on his eye because that doesn't give it power. He's got it balanced in between. So there's space between your eye, between the lens, and then between the lens of the magnifier and the object. And I call that the sweet spot when the letters or the numbers or what I'm looking at it gets clear. It's not fuzzy or blurry anymore. And the student on the right is looking at um, a box of Cheez-Its. Um, and he's, I always ask students um, because we, um, it's good to take care of ourselves and know that we're choosing healthy food and comparing things like calories or grams of fat, grams of sodium, and your magnifiers, um, maybe this afternoon, you can just go compare a lot of things in the pantry, in the cupboard at home, and talk with your parents about what's healthier to eat, what's not. 
And so on the next slide, it gives a couple more examples. And then I'm going to demonstrate um, showing the magnifier. So the picture on the left is showing a student has a magnifier and looking at a remote control. There are so many buttons on a remote control and it can be hard to remember. I can usually remember where changing the volume and changing the channel is, but there's lots of other buttons on there. And if I can examine it, if I can get an idea of what are the markings, it's going to help me remember more what part of the, what button I'm pushing on the remote. And then there's a student on the right who's looking at the dryer settings. And um, it's a good practice for um, that skill of doing your own laundry. So that's just a couple of examples of using your magnifier. So I'm going to hold up, um, actually, I have a, this is a little ornate container on my uh, shelf. And I've got a magnifier here that if I position it, and I'm uh, get myself in the camera right, I'm holding up this item. And then I'm going to look at it. And it's really ornate. And I can tell that there's like, plant markings and there's a figure in this or if I want to look at I have a piece of jewelry here that is not in the camera I have to figure out there it is and I can examine that so there's smaller beads in it and there's some metal along the edges. So that's something to examine. And if I'm going to read a book, sometimes it's hard to keep my place on the page. So at the beginning, I might just use like a line guide. And that I'm holding on the page. And I'd be doing this on a book stand probably. But then I can hold my magnifier. Um, and be able to move along the line. And then I move that line guide down as I move down the page. <clears throat> and the more you do this, the more your brain gets used to it. And then you won't need the line guide as much. And for some, most of us, the, when we say magnifier, it magnifies. It makes things bigger. It makes them easier to see. But for some students, uh, say who might have CVI and their the their vision actually they might have 2040 or 2050 vision that's pretty good vision but what the magnifier does is it isolates it blocks out a lot of the page so it's just isolating what I'm um, what my target is what I'm trying to see so if I looked at <clears throat> Here's my box of Milton's crackers and figuring out, okay, total fat is three grams, 70 calories in a serving. That's pretty good. That's, that's not bad for a cracker. Now my preferred one is going to be Cheetos and bags that are glossy can be a little harder to read the finding the important nutritional information but that's part of the practice is figuring out, oh, if I, I kind of change the angle, it might take the glare off of the bag. So that's some examples of um, using your magnifier to look at things. We have uh, some questions for you, Cindy. Okay. Um, one question is, are these of any benefit to a student with only light perception? You would need to have, no. The short answer, um, more detail vision, more, um, uh, more than light perception. That's a great question. And um, having light perception is really helpful. That gives you information still, but magnifiers are not built for um, that level of vision. And then we have two uh, hands raised. Uh, let's start with Uriah. And Uriah, you know what to do. 
Hello? Hi, go ahead. Um, so my question is, how can you see um, what is happening if you're like cooking? And with magnifiers, that's a really good question. And the cool thing about cooking is that we're using all kinds of our senses. So the magnifier isn't gonna work very well to help me examine a pan of bacon. Is it done cooking? But I can smell when it's getting closer to done and I can hear that, yep, it's like when you hear popcorn in the microwave. You know it's close for that bag to come out when you don't hear any more popping. With my telescope, and we'll um, move to that, I could, and a little bit later, I'll talk about setting it on short focus, and I could look at the bacon on the stove from a safer distance if I wanted to. So that's a good question. Thank you, and Lynette has a question. Go ahead, Lynette. I'm sorry, I, I'm i here with my son, Armand. He's, yeah, that's um, my name. He's five, he pressed it by accident, we're just watching. Okay, well, we're glad you're here. Thank, Thank you. you. And Keen, do you have a question? Hello? Yes, hi, go ahead. Um, is there any of those um, devices um, that could be uh, accessible for visually impaired people? Like, is there any that you would know of, you know what I mean? Something similar like that? There's lots of different kinds of tools. And um, depending on your level of vision, a low vision specialist can match the right tool to your vision and what it is you're wanting to look at. They, you can order them online as well because they're, they're available, but you're kind of making a guess on is this the tool that's going to work for me because the, I talked about there's different powers and sometimes students are just given a, here's an 8x, that sounds like a good amount of power, but that might be too much power and it's frustrating to use. It's like taking a sledgehammer when all I need is a hammer. If the, to the, the tool should be mapped to your level of vision. So are they available? Yes, through a low vision specialist, you could um, visit, have a low vision exam and find out what could work for you. I think that's it for now, Cindy, go ahead. And if we um, go, the next slide is gonna give just a couple pointers on the strategies that we practice. So with magnifiers, you heard me say finding the sweet spot. And a lot of it is just experimenting. Just try it. And I'll have students tell me, well, I don't like to use it. And I can get frustrated too. Um, you know, my sisters or my friends, they can just glance at something and they're seeing it really quickly where I have to, you know, I, I get the magnifier in the right spot. But I'm really proud that I can see that for myself. When I go to uh, sit down restaurants, um, and I'm able to look, hold a menu in my hand, rather than asking somebody to read it for me, I like reading menus because I want to know, is it chipotle mayonnaise or wasabi mayonnaise? To me, that's important. And if I'm asking somebody to read it, they, they may skip some of that information. So practicing on finding the sweet spot where things become clear and in focus, um, and then stabilizing. If um, when I made that, was holding my magnifier up, because I'm trying to keep it in the camera, I'm not flat on a desk or a book stand, but it's important to, I can like rest my pinky. If my uh, thumb and first finger are holding the magnifier, I can rest my pinky where it stabilizes, where I'm not, you know, because if I hold it up too much, I'm gonna start shaking, my muscles will get tired. So I need to find a way to stabilize and move smoothly if I'm, say, looking at a book. And then I can even twist and use my third and fourth finger to hold the magnifier and then maybe just 
rest my wrist on the page. So finding a way that your hand is stable. And everybody has their own methods, and I have a couple of methods because I want to switch out. I don't um, want my, my hand to get tight on that. So I showed using the line guide, um, especially, and that's helpful with books. So the next slide just asks, how are we doing? How are you doing? Is it working? Are you finding that sweet spot with the different things you're looking at? So Cindy, are you, are you asking? Uh, yeah, do, are there any, because we're going to move over to telescopes here in a minute. So are there any more questions on magnifiers? So one student says, good, it's working, it's working well with the magnifier. That's from Parker. Thanks, Parker. Uriah has his hand up again. Uriah, you want to uh, tell us what you're thinking? Um, hello? Go ahead, Mireya. Um, so the magnifier is working well for me when I'm doing my homework or reading a question on my homework. That's great. Glad to hear that. Aisha, go ahead. So as I was saying, I used the um back to the, <clears throat> the technology thing. I I forgot to mention I also used Read to Go Good. on my iPhone i or iPhone, which is a uh, twenty dollar uh, uh it's an app for um for vision impairment. Yes, I know some students who use that. It's a good one. Thank you. Thanks, Aisha. And uh, Mary is asking, what kind of devices would benefit someone who has macular degeneration? Uh, magnifiers, for sure. They, because they're going to have that central cloudiness through macular degeneration. And uh, star guards would be the young person's version of macular degeneration. And so if a magnifier will make something bigger and it makes it easier to see, that's all these tools are doing because it, it makes it bigger and your eye can get a hold of more of the information. So depending on the level of degeneration they've had, the amount of vision that a person does have, matching is a 3X magnifier, the right power, or would the person need a 6X or a 7X? Because if I get too strong, it can be frustrating to users. I think that's it for now. Okay, we're going to switch over to telescopes. And I've got a couple of pictures here. The one on the left is one of our students who was able, we did an outing to a dinosaur park where we were looking at models of dinosaurs. And I think this is Brontosaurus. I may get corrected on that but the one with the super, super tall, long neck, and his head is, I don't know, 40 feet above the suit. And by taking his telescope, he can look at, can I find the teeth? Can I see what the eyes look like that are way up above my head? And if he can find the, the dinosaur itself and then just follow up the neck because the head is kind of hanging out there in space so I'm going to trace along up the neck slowly till I get to the top of the head and then the student on the right is we had been able to go to a farm for an outing and anybody I know who has chickens loves them they say they are hilarious to watch and our young girl here is examining these chickens through her telescope. So if you take your telescope and you, uh, actually, I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. Kind of jumped ahead of myself. So another example here of the, on the next slide is we have a uh, student who we had gone to a nature center and they're looking out across this expanse of grass 
and into the trees and following the trail that goes along. And on the right, there's a student, he's looking at, we had gone to a grocery store that had a good fish market and the students, they could smell the fish, really fishy smell before we got there. And one of the students, oh, what is in that barrel? <coughs> and he wanted to use his telescope to see something that was say maybe 10 inches away, 12 inches away, beyond my, if I stretch my arm out beyond my fingers, just beyond that. And if I start with the telescope in the closed position, meaning it's as short as possible, and then, and we can, um, if you can switch or uh, come back to me, Leanne, I can demonstrate, thank you. Um, so it's closed in the short position, and I start turning the barrel. I'm looking through it, and you've got to let your, your brain gets to adjust to looking through that telescope. It seems weird to, wow, I'm putting something in front of my eye, but if you let yourself look through the tube and slowly, slowly turn, because if it's not up to my eye and I'm just turning it, I have no idea. Is it getting better or worse? Is it getting clearer or fuzzier? So if it's short, generally I'm seeing things far away. I'm looking out, I'm sitting at a window in my house and I'm looking out and I can see the tree branches that are, gosh, maybe 40 feet away. Now, if I make it longer, I'm able to look at, I have a paper in front of me that's probably 12 inches away and I can focus in on that as it's just a little bit open, not all the way short, but a little bit open. <clears throat> and I give the example of, I love pastry. And if I go to the pastry shop and in the pastry case, I don't know <coughs> what these items are, but I can read <coughs> the labels of what's in that pastry case by making my telescope just a little bit longer. I'm gonna take, take a sip of water. So you can see I have two telescopes here. Get it lined up in the camera. One's a little shorter than the other. Um, my 4X, I keep at my, um, at my coffee table in my living room. So if I sit on the couch, because I like to sit back where everybody else is, and if, oh, I'm not sure who that character is on the screen, I can grab my scope and identify that character. Or if the news is on and there's some words <coughs> scrolling across the screen or the weather reports on, I can find the, um, what the temperature is going to be with my 4X scope. But if I go outdoors, I'm going to use my stronger one, my 6X, to look at things that are farther away. And if we go back to the slides. There's some pointers on using your telescopes and strategies. So I think of it as the three Fs. I first need to find the object through the scope. And remember, starting with bigger objects or bolder color is easier. So I find it with my eyes and then I hold the scope up and I can, okay, I've landed on the object, <clears throat> so I found it, but then I want to focus. <coughs> and I'm going to slowly set the focus on the scope as I slowly, slowly turn the barrel. And I always tell my students, we don't want just good enough. It's not all the way clear, but it's better. We want great focus. So I have to keep turning past the clear mark to say, yep, okay, now I need to go back to where it was clear. And it's really slow. Parents, you can generally <clears throat> set focus on the telescope for your student because all it's doing, it's magnifying it for your student. It's magnifying it for you. 
And if a student has a really high refractive error, has really strong glasses, they might still want to adjust the focus, but you can, the parent can get close by setting the focus. And I always ask my students is, okay, I'm going to find something harder for you to read to test. Is it clear something maybe smaller uh, or farther away to test? Are you really able to see that? Because the student can demonstrate for me, yep, I'm reading that information. Or yes, I can tell if you're making a silly face or a sad face. Or yes, if you're 15 feet away from me in the living room and you have some surprise object you're going to hold up. Yes, that's my Easter bunny hat or that's a spatula from the kitchen. Then your, the, your child is showing you, yes, I can see this stuff. So also with um, stabilizing. So if I'm sitting at the couch watching the TV, it's really easy because maybe I can set my elbow on the edge of the couch. Or <clears throat> if you make a cup your hand and put it under the elbow that's holding the telescope. So get myself, I'm going to keep my arm close to me, but I've got my elbow. <laughs> I keep playing with my camera cupped. And I've, I've got a base. I'm balancing my elbow and then able to look through my scope. Or if I'm outside at a railing, I could rest my elbow on that railing. But I want to find a way to get my arm steady rather than having it shaking out here while I'm trying to hold the scope. So if I steady it, then it's, I can do longer viewings. And the TV is good practice because that box of the TV screen, it's, it's not going to move. What's inside the box moves, but you can follow the characters moving through that scope. So once I found the object, I set focus, and either I fixate on it or I follow something moving. So if you're looking out your living room window, <clears throat> You could maybe follow a car that's going slowly down the street. Or if you've got a dog in the backyard. Um, when I did my walk this morning, I was surprised how many squirrels were out. It must be because it was early. And there were even deer on the golf course where I was walking. Um, and it would I didn't have my scope with me on the hike today, but I could have looked at the faces of the deer on the trail. So they're standing still, I fixate on them, I set focus, and then they start moving, and I can follow them. And that, that can be a little harder. But again, we've got a great time to be practicing now on finding things that are interesting and building that skill of um, being able to see something through your telescope as it's moving. So... The, how's it working? How are you doing on the scope? That's some real quick pointers. I know it's um, all, mostly this is about practice, giving yourself some general rules, principles to follow, but now it comes down to you practicing. So students, please write in the chat box or raise your hand if you wanna share how you're doing with your scope at home or or in your community. I'm afraid I'm gonna pronounce your name wrong, but Pixodi? Sorry, it's my son Brack. Brack, okay. Go ahead, Brack. Um, my telescope is doing good. Good. Because he keeps taking it apart. Oh. He, he's in kindergarten. Two pieces? They're hard to put back together. Uh -huh. They don't always work as well. And that's a really good point that I know um, I'll always ask students when they come to a program, I want to look through your scope. Because sometimes they have sat in a drawer for so long or been at the bottom of a backpack that they've gotten dust in them or they got water in them. And the student is 
I don't like looking through it. Well, I wouldn't look, like looking through it either if it was full of dust or had water in it. So I always want to check that sometimes the barrel, it just spins because it's become, it's come loose. So we're not doing a repair session on the lesson today. Sometimes you can screw them back together, but they do come apart and they don't go back together very easily. Uh, next question, Susie wants to know, is the telescope attached to a lanyard? I'm concerned about my student dropping it or dropping it over the edge of a fence or barrier like at the zoo. That is a great point because telescopes are generally are about, they can, they range in price, but they're at least $50 and I wouldn't want to throw $50 over the railing. So I do have um, the, the lanyard that you wear it around your neck so that I don't have to get it out of my pocket. It's right there. So it's really good idea to have the lanyard around your neck when you're using the scope. And Sarah was asks, where can the scopes be purchased? Again, um, my best advice is through a low vision specialist and you could talk to your vision teacher or your um, O&M person about finding out how could I get to a low vision exam. Um, sometimes vision departments have a supply of tools and I think um, either a TVI or a comms might just practice with you on trying different tools before you go to your low vision exam. So you've had it in your hand, you know what it feels like, you know how to bring it up to your eye. They can be purchased online, but again, if that's, that's, you're just not sure what you're getting sometimes on if it's the right tool for you. And we've got just a couple more slides and about, ooh, only a couple minutes. So this last one, um, it says roadblock. What makes it hard to use tools? And I, I always tell my students, it's, it's not a perfect tool. It does not let me see 80 feet away or sometimes super tiny things. The, the power is, is not limitless, but it's, it's a tool that helps me see more. And I, I always, it's building the skill, that's practice, 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 and then building the confidence to use it in front of somebody. I can remember um, being in stores and I'm using my tool and a customer is just staring. And I'm, hey, why are you staring at me, I wanna say. And it's, they haven't seen anybody use a telescope before to read the signs overhead. Most people aren't mean about it. They just, wow, I've not seen that before. And then I can decide. Do I want to say it's it's called a telescope and it just makes things bigger, makes it easier to me to, for me to see. That's it. So I want to get comfortable with being able to explain it when somebody is being friendly or curious. And then building the habit until you have that tool with you. Because I carry it in my bag to the store, to the restaurant, when I'm I know I'm on a new trail, especially. I'll have my telescope to be able to see more on the trail. And it's having your expectation to use it and then motivation to be using it as well. And this almost last slide. So you can fill these in, making my wish list. And I've got three questions, but they're all kind of the same thing. What are some new ideas for cool things I want to see? What are new ideas for places I want to go to try my device? And then what are new ideas for challenging goals I want to set? Because these handheld tools, they're very affordable, they're really portable, they're quick, they're grab it and go. I don't have to turn it on and switch over to the magnifier app and then uh, zoom in and figure out. It's just, I bring it up to my eye if it's the telescope and I find what I want to look at. Or with my magnifier, just setting it, um, finding that sweet spot for it. 
So it's all about what captures your attention and, and figure that knowing that's what I want to go look at. And I, I know we're out of time. I thank you for joining the session today and um, sharing your ideas. And my contact info is on the screen. I'm, I'm happy to visit more. Um, thank thank you, Cindy. Thank, thank you, you for sharing the different types of devices and all the different things that you use them for, both near and distance. Got some great ideas. We had a few questions come through. If we can answer maybe two or three questions before we close. Great. So one is, what do you think of the full sheet magnifier? I am not a fan of them. Um, they are very low powered um, and often not quality optics. Um, but then I always, if a student demonstrates for me that, yeah, I can see better with that. Um, I, I can't argue with that. Performance shows, but I think a lot of times students, they want to please adults who are trying to help them. So they just, yeah, yeah, it, it helps. But unless they can demonstrate, show me better performance, I've not seen very many sheet magnifiers that are quality. You're getting people who agree with you in the chat box. <laughs> Um, Cindy, we're going to have to stop the recording, but then we can stay on maybe for another couple of minutes. There are some hands raised and a few more questions in the chat box. Cheryl, can you tell us what's next? Of course. We have a really, really awesome session coming up tomorrow. And our presenter's name is... Cecilia Robinson. Robinson, and she will be working on keyboarding. She comes to us from Texas School for the Blinds Outreach Programs as the technology consultant. So we hope that you will join us tomorrow for another great session of Virtual Excel Academy. Bye for now. Bye for now. If, Bye this, top if this topic interests you and you are an adult, uh, APH has a benefits of contrast lighting and filters, which you might find helpful with your low vision students. Again, that's more for adults, not that a student couldn't join us, but that is on Wednesday at noon Eastern Standard Time the benefits of contrast lighting and filters. And we're also excited that Cindy will be back with us again uh, next Wednesday, the 29th, um, doing a session on learning about my eyes. So be sure to come back for that. Cindy, if you can answer just a couple more questions.